Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. More updates continue to come in on the dozens of bodies that were found in an 18 wheeler. And tonight, authorities are saying that a fourth person is in custody. 28 year old Christian Martinez facing charges in that case. Court documents show he was found in Palestine, Texas yesterday. Three suspects also accused in the case, including 45 year old Omero Zamorano. Investigators say Zamorano and Martinez were actually talking about the alleged smuggling event on a cell phone. A search warrant for that cell phone led authorities to Martinez. Two more suspects are in custody, but as of right now, they are only facing federal weapons charges. So the people that we're telling you about were found Monday and the death toll continues to rise tonight. It stands at 53, 53 people are dead after being left in a hot tractor trailer. And that includes some of the people who were taken to area hospitals on Monday night. 16 people were taken to hospitals and tonight 11 of them remain in the hospital. That includes children. Several, though, are still in critical condition. Meantime, people in San Antonio are calling for change. Travis Park, a gathering place tonight for several groups, including Corazon Ministries and the Black Freedom Factory. They don't want to see any more migrant deaths. They're calling for policy changes and more transparency. There are so many questions about how that 18 wheeler got here. In a news conference today, Mexican government officials say the truck entered the United States through Laredo. That's right. Customs and Border Patrol cameras show the truck passing some checkpoints in Encinal and Catula. Concerned families have been calling the Mexican consulate in San Antonio because they're worried that their missing loved ones might have been in that semi trailer. The 19th Patty Santos has been in touch with one of those worried families and has their story. Lily Hernandez says she's been calling San Antonio hospitals, immigration offices, and the McAllen Mexican consul trying to find her brother, Pablo Hernandez. I know he was walking with a group of people and that the people he was with left him because he couldn't walk. He was cramping up and he couldn't keep going. The 20 year old left Reynosa, Mexico in early June and called to say he was in Falfurias, Texas last Wednesday. He was headed to Houston. There's an anxiety of not knowing if he's fine or if he needs something. You have so many thoughts of what could have happened. One of those thoughts is that he might have been in the semi-trailer where more than 50 migrants died this week. The Mexican consulate and other Central American consulates are working to identify the dead and those in the hospital. 27 of the deceased have been confirmed as Mexican nationals. More than 100 calls from families with missing loved ones have tied up phone lines at the consulate. Hernandez says she tried to talk her brother out of crossing, but his resolve was greater than fear. We're hopeful we can find him. And tonight she tells us her brother has a scar near his collarbone. She hopes maybe that could help someone identify him. And Stephen Stefania, she also tells us that she's tried to get the word out on social media to see if she can find him. But instead, she has received people who are trying to scam her or extort her family of money. And also, um, she says she has spent hours calling local agencies, trying to find out information, only to find there is none. We'll send it back to you. And we can only hope that she gets answers soon. Thank you, Patty. Now, the federal government is taking the lead in the investigation here in San Antonio. Those who survived the intense heat in that 18 wheeler will likely need resources as they recover. So a group known as sacred.org created an online directory of human services in San Antonio, and it's hoping to get the information out to migrants and their caseworkers. From there, they can find help with groceries and other support as they go through the legal process. We have more information right now on KSAT.com. As the survivors of the human smuggling tragedy are fighting to recover in the hospital, the San Antonio Fire Department caring for their own, not only in the physical sense, but their mental needs as their mental health needs as well. As one fire official tells the night teams, Lee Waldman, they don't care for the community. They can't care for the community if they don't care for themselves. An unforgettable scene. We're not supposed to open up a truck and see stacks of bodies in there. Um, none of us come to work imagining that. Leaving a lasting impression on those who responded. It was a horrific scene, um, something I'll never forget. And it's 
it'll stick with us forever. The deaths of 53 migrants found inside of an 18 wheeler is weighing on the emergency crews who were desperate to save them. You did exactly what you were trained to do. You did a great job because they need to hear those things because they feel guilty about not saving more people. Immediately on the scene, the rehab process for those responding crews started. We start that resiliency process right away. It's uh, critical. Now, two days later, Joe Arrington with SAFD says the department's trained peer support team is continuing to help alongside their psychologists and chaplains. They can you know, encourage those conversations, getting it out there, not bottling it up and dealing with it in un unhealthy ways. The department understands the job isn't done until everyone is cared for, including each other. That's how we're going to be able to move forward as stronger and healthier as we're all taking care of ourselves. Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. We continue to share updates and new information on KSAT social media pages and on KSAT.com. Coming up in less than 10 minutes, we're going to take a look at the crossings we witnessed live in Eagle Pass today and what the governor says will now happen in that area along the border. San Antonio police say they have the man who killed 40 year old Christopher Olivares in custody. It's been nine months since Olivares was found dead at his southwest side home. The night team's John Paul Barajas was there as police brought that suspect in. So John Paul, tell us what have you learned? Stephanie, police identified the suspect as 20 year old Sebastian Hernandez, and they tell us this was not his first time here at public safety headquarters. His name was given in a Crime Stoppers tip. They brought him in for questioning, but at that time they did not have enough to arrest him. Today, as he was cuffed and walked to a police unit, he had very little to say to our cameras. Why did you do this? That night? I never did you kill Christopher? Did you kill Christopher? Do you know who killed Christopher? Are you guilty? Hernandez is accused of stabbing Olivares and stealing his car. It was later found abandoned and burned outside city limits. Police say the two men knew each other, but they did not give a motive. Investigators tell us they can tie Hernandez to the murder through a DNA sample and his appearance in several doorbell videos at Olivares' home from before the stabbing and again the night of the murder. He's claiming his innocence, but we, our, our detectives had enough probable cause and enough evidence to charge him with murder. Police say that the suspect is cooperating and was taken into custody without incident. Murder is a first degree felony punishable with up to a life sentence. I've been texting back and forth with Olivares' mother. She says this news is a blessing. At Public Safety Headquarters, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, John Paul, that family's had a lot of questions throughout this process. Thank you. Well, Bear County deputies are working a different homicide case tonight. This one involved two scenes about 10 miles apart. Investigators are looking for two shooting suspects in this case. It all started around one this afternoon on Calle Fincius. That's in Southwest Bear County. Witnesses told deputies someone shot a man in a car. That car then slowly rolled into a nearby wooded area where deputies say the two men ran up to that car and fired even more shots inside. Investigators say the suspects got about 10 miles away near Southwest ISD. They left the car they were in behind and actually ran away. Not clear if that suspect vehicle was actually stolen. And today, not much in terms of showers across our area, just a few isolated ones closer to the coast and even along the Rio Grande. Otherwise, 97, that was our high temperature today. And overall, the average temperature of the day was a little below normal, just two days. We've had that this month. And we will be well into the 90s in the days ahead, but the question is, what about that moisture in the Gulf of Mexico? Where is that going to go? Who's going to see the most rain? I'm going to tell you about that and time it out for you in just a bit. They've waited five years for justice, only to be faced with disappointment. Tonight, we're hearing from the parents of a three-year-old murder victim just hours after a jury found the suspect not guilty. Also, we're going to see what Eagle Pass is experiencing when it comes to these border crossings, plus what the governor and his political opponents say needs to happen. It's next on The Night Beat. New tonight, police say she allegedly killed an off-duty Poteet police officer. The Austin Police Department says that 26-year-old Lindsay Smith is accused of intoxication assault. This all happened around 2 this morning. Investigators say she was driving in a construction zone when she hit the off-duty officer. That victim, now identified as Jeffrey Richardson, we're told that Smith stayed at the scene 
but police booked her for intoxication assault. And now her bond is set at $250,000. Ground zero when it comes to immigration. That's what Texas Governor Greg Abbott is calling the Eagle Pass Del Rio sector. U.S. Border Patrol says it stopped 2,915 people just this weekend. Our Alicia Barrera was in Eagle Pass as more immigrants attempted to make their way into the United States. But this is exactly the issue that the chief of police for Eagle Pass was talking about. You watched it live during the six o'clock news. There you see one of them actually trying to defy the current of the Rio Grande and trying to make it over to the U.S. These are live images that you're watching. And they did. Ha sido el de uh, mes y medio, sí, a moment, a month and a half in the making. And when asked if they had any fear of what may come next with their immigration case. Oh. Yeah, he's be on that side of line. We are. We're walking. Yeah, We're yeah, walking right walking with you. Way, you're not walking that way. They say they're simply happy. The crossings are at record highs. And this is an issue that the chief of police for the city of Eagle Pass says is becoming more frequent and they're overwhelmed. You know, police departments are meant to uh, handle issues yeah. in their cities uh, that they're responsible for. Illegal immigration just added more to it. Within a week, 100 additional DPS troopers will be deployed to Maverick County. The Texas Department of Public Safety is creating two strike teams to detect, deter, and apprehend unlawful crossings of illegal immigrants. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Governor Greg Abbott also mentioned DPS will create and monitor new checkpoints for trucks entering from Mexico. His Democratic opponent in the race for governor also reacting to this. This week, former Congressman Beto O'Rourke took to Twitter, saying in part, quote, we need to dismantle human smuggling rings and replace them with expanded avenues for legal migration, end quote. A murder trial now over. The suspect in a three-year-old's death is now over. The parents of little Rene Blancas Jr. are speaking with KSAT. We've been following this trial against Eric Trevino for weeks already. He was accused of shooting three-year-old Rene Blancas Jr. while he was sleeping in the back of his family's car on New Laredo Highway. That was back in 2017. His parents picked out Trevino out of a photo lineup and that's what led to his arrest. But today, a jury acquitted Trevino of capital murder. The family says that he got away with murder because the charge should have been first degree felony murder. He's a coward. He was raised by cowards to be a coward. It's a really crappy situation that he'll never understand what he did to us. I was raising my son to be a real man. And then he got away through a technicality. And now he's celebrating probably knowing that he got away with it through a technicality. Rene Jr. would have been eight years old now. His father says that he sees a lot of boys that remind him of his son every day. Police say that a gold-colored Honda was the suspect vehicle. Investigators say that Trevino's mother bought the same car and then said that Trevino tried to return that car after the shooting. His lawyer argued that Trevino's Cadillac tattoos show that he wouldn't handle a Honda. His attorney also argued that it was too dark at the scene to identify anybody who would have been in that car. So a jury decided that Trevino was not guilty, but he remains in jail facing other charges related to other crimes, including an attempted jail escape. He is the police chief of the Uvalde School District and a city councilman there. And tomorrow could mark Pete Arredondo's first appearance at a Uvalde city council meeting. The council scheduled to hold a special meeting tomorrow to discuss the Robb Elementary shooting. The executive session discussion, that's the only topic on the agenda. City policy says council members who miss three meetings can be voted out by the council. If he is absent, this would be considered Arredondo's first strike. Now we're going to take a live look outside. There you have it. 84 degrees out there right now. And, you know, we had a, kind of a pretty day today, Adam. Yeah, and now we actually have a little splash of green mixed in with all the brown <laughs> across, across our area, all the dead grass, and now a little bit of green mixing its way in after yesterday's rainfall. So it's nice that we have a little bit of that, and the aquifer did rise one foot from the rainfall yesterday. It's probably still responding to it as well. So we'll give you that update come tomorrow at nine when we get the official reading. Let's get to rain chances. This is around town. I'm sorry, only 20% every afternoon through Saturday. That's the best we can do. A few random brief rogue pop up 
afternoon showers here and there. It's a different story though when you go farther to the east. Now even today, Closer to the Gulf Coast, we had a few downpours, particularly Victoria toward Goliad, and that's closer to this big swirl we have in the atmosphere. It's a very weak area of low pressure. The center of it is just east of Brownsville right now, but you see this widespread swath of rain associated with it. It's that same unorganized cluster of showers and storms we've been talking about for a few days, but now it actually has a little bit of a central swirl to it, which at least helps the model guidance get a better handle on the situation and it is falling in line with what we've been saying where it's probably going to be east of San Antonio. 40% chance of developing into a tropical disturbance, even if it gets or top tropical depression, I should say, even if it gets that title, the impacts are the same. Some heavy rainfall for parts of the Gulf Coast and locations east of San Antonio. There's a look at those spaghetti plots starting to tighten up a little bit farther to the east of town and closer to Houston. In terms of rainfall potential, uh, off and on showers and storms daily through Saturday, particularly from about San Antonio Bay northward all the way to Houston Galveston area. That's where you could have up to five inches of rain, but notice how you get inland and those rainfall accumulations fall off significantly. Now I do think there will be a few periodic showers as close as Hallettsville, Shiner, Moulton, maybe Gonzales and Cuero, but again, vast majority of it closer to the Gulf Coast. All right, right now, 85 degrees, dew point is 66. So the dew points are on the rise, humidity's climbing as well, but temperatures are in the 80s, with the exception of Catula at 91. We're 81 Bernie, 83 New Braunfels, and 86 now in Uvalde. Tomorrow, we'll start the day, 73 degrees in the morning. By noon, upper 80s. By 5 p.m., mid 90s, about 94 or 95 around San Antonio. 20% chance of that rogue pop up afternoon shower along the Rio Grande, triple digits, 100 degrees, Del Rio, Eagle Pass. And elsewhere, we're mainly just looking at mid 90s. Von Army 96, 94 Converse, west side of town about 95. You get up to Timberwood Park about 93, and Leon Springs 94. Here's a look at the rest of the week, though. More of the same through Saturday by Sunday. We're getting back close to the century mark, right near 100 degrees. Nothing but sunshine Sunday all the way through the 4th of July. And if you do have plans on going to the coast, I mentioned we'll have some rain showers daily through Saturday, but come Sunday, that should be all be out of there. So even at the coast, it should clear up by Sunday. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. If you thought the Spurs were already in a total rebuild, yeah. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> yeah. We got a trade to tell you about. Pump the brakes. Yeah. yeah. Well, DeJounte is gone. The big question right now is what triggered the trade? When we come back, more about that, including DeJounte's first reaction being traded out of San Antonio and is getting rid of Lonnie Walker the fourth next. Coming up. DeJounte Murray, who came to the Spurs in 2016 as the team's 29th overall pick in the first round and blossomed into an all-star guard in just five seasons, has been traded to the Atlanta Hawks for three first-round draft picks and a swap of one future first-round pick and for Danilo Gallinari. This is arguably the boldest move in team history since you normally build a team around an all-star rather than trade him. But it'll be just two years from now where Murray will be in line for a max deal worth around $40 million a season. But his trade-worthiness will probably never be higher at this moment in his career at just 25 years of age. Now, here's a look at what the Spurs get in the trade. A 2023 first-round pick via the Hornets, 2025-2026 swap of first-round picks with Atlanta, and a 2027 first-round pick along with Gallinari. And, of course, the Hawks will receive DeJounte Murray. And we're getting reaction tonight from DeJounte on social media. San Antonio, I love you forever. Thank you, Spurs and the whole city, for believing in me and embracing me from day one. I want to write a whole book, but it's not easy. And we are family. It's always going to be bigger than basketball. Gallinari's contract is only partially guaranteed for this coming season but can be bought out today for the Spurs here for $5 million. If not, the contract becomes fully guaranteed at $21.5 million. Lonnie Walker IV has been issued a qualifying offer of $6.3 million to make him a restricted free agent. That's according to the Express News after today's deadline was met. Otherwise, Walker would have been an unrestricted free agent. By issuing the qualifying offer, the Spurs have the right to match any offer any other team may make. Walker's been with the Spurs for four seasons, coming off as the best Season and point production at 12.1 per game while endearing himself to the community.
A setback right out of the gate for Spurs top draft pick Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor. He will not be able to practice with his new teammates this week after being placed in the NBA's health and safety protocols. That's rough since the Spurs are set to practice four times this week before heading to Las Vegas to tip off the Summer League on Friday, July 8th. There's still a question whether or not he will suit up even if he's cleared to return since he hasn't had a chance to work out. His teammates are sympathetic to his situation after the Spurs made Sohan the number nine overall pick, especially since the three draft picks were together all weekend long and only one tested positive for COVID. That's how we was when we first got here. Like we was just hanging out all the time and then, you know, he got it. But um, speedy recovery is going to be okay. Have you texted with him, talked to him? Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, he asked me how um, practice has been going. I've been telling him, you know, just just to keep him in the loop. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, you got to keep my boy in the loop. I think he's a really smart guy. He'll be able to figure out everything. Uh, but it, it's tough because this is the time where everyone's learning, getting all the concepts down. But like I said, he's a smart guy. I think he'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly. All right, the Spurs Summer League team that also features the Spurs third draft pick and number 25 overall, Blake Wesley, out of Notre Dame, held their first workout today to get ready for that Summer League games that tip off one week from this Friday in Las Vegas. And while Spurs head coach Greg Popovich was there, it will be his assistant, Mitch Johnson, who will coach the team in Las Vegas. I think that in general, it's the same every year, right? It's, it's enthusiasm, it's excitement. You know, these kids want to prove whether they can, uh, you know, should be at this level or that, you know, justify why they were drafted. Um, but I think Blake is obviously a very dynamic driver, very athletic. His speed stands out when you watch him. And I think Malachi has a little bit of a throwback game in terms of kind of crafty, he uses some change of speed, uh, finds some spots, ways to score. So I think they both have knacks and, and skill sets that will help us. The longest tenured player on SAFC retiring next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. There is a report out today that says despite the fact the NFL is insisting on an indefinite suspension for Deshaun Watson for violating the league's personal code of conduct for his behavior during massages, the league would accept a six to eight game suspension if that is what disciplinary officer Sue L. Robinson would rule during hearings underway. That's according to the Associated Press and the reason that would force the league to appeal to the commissioner, Roger Goodell, according to the collective bargaining agreement where most of his staff believes Watson should sit out an entire season without pay. It's after he was sued by 24 women in civil lawsuits, 20 of which have been settled for sexual assault and misconduct during those massages. San Antonio goalkeeper Mac Bordoni has announced he will retire at the end of this Saturday's match at Toyota Field against Charleston Battery. That's after playing his entire soccer career in San Antonio and high school, college, and now professionally. What a local success story, starting with MacArthur High School, followed by All-America Honors twice in four years at Trinity University, and then professionally, first with the San Antonio Scorpions, starting in 2015 and 16, finally with SAFC for the last seven and a half seasons. And there's a reason he's retiring. He's enrolling in the Dedman School of Law at Southern Methodist University. It's just the right time for me in my in my personal life and stuff I wanted to do after soccer. Um, I actually headed off to uh, law school up in Dallas at, at SMU uh, in uh, about a month or two. Um, so after after this, I'm got a got a few days off, then I got to start working on that, uh, get prepped and moved and stuff like that. I'm <laughs> not pretty big challenge awaits him, but he he changes his defense. Would you say? I don't know. Sort of defender. Yeah. The beard is going to be taking the boards. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, he is. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back after this. I want to get to some breaking news before we leave you tonight. San Antonio police are now responding to a deadly shooting involving a juvenile. Officers have not arrested, have not released an age on the victim, but they did confirm that that person has died. So you're getting a live picture here. It's north of downtown near Rex Street in Maine, not too far from Kenwood Park. Police say they have a description on a suspect vehicle, but they didn't release those details. Of course, we're going to continue to follow the story online at ksat.com. Also, tune in to GMSA at 430 for the latest developments on this. All right, tomorrow we'll have high temperatures well into the 90s across our area, even about 100 degrees along the Rio Grande, but 95 Rio Medina, Seguin 93, Bulverde 92, about 94 around San Antonio. Same story through Saturday, then Sunday back up close to 100 and we'll be there into next week. Just a few pop up afternoon showers here and there through Saturday. Don't cancel your outdoor plans. Okay, thank you and thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow morning.